Okay, let me show you a, a couple of other turbulent patterns. I don't, I don't want you to get the idea that this only applies in um, in pipes. So, for example, these are actually images of similar things that I showed laminar patterns for. So, um, the left one is flow over like a, a tiny step barrier, and um, what you'll see is that there are areas of the flow that are turbulent, or sorry, that are laminar, but there are other areas of the flow that actually have turbulence, and um, in particular, turbulence, like because turbulence basically starts from instabilities caused by rotating vortices, turbulence tends to start off sort of the backside of objects where these vortices basically get shed. Um, so you can identify some laminar regions of the flow, but there's also turbulent regions that are mostly behind the objects. Um, so on the left hand side, we've got a wall, and on the right hand side, there is a um, you know, I guess this is a sphere traveling, it's meant to be traveling through a fluid. And you can see that like in each case on the back side of the object, there are little turbulent vortices that basically um, get shed leading to turbulence on the back side. So um, in these cases, there's still something like a Reynolds number that you can define. It's just that you have to define it like it's a dimensionless ratio. Um, and the critical dimensionless ratio that determines whether it's turbulent just it gets calculated a little bit differently. So um, you can still form a dimensionless number, but you still you have to define a slightly different length scale. So instead of like diameter of the pipe, you might choose like the height of the barrier um, on in the case of you know a step barrier or the diameter of a sphere. So like how you would like define the the critical length scale would be one thing. And then the other thing is that just the, the value of the, the Reynolds number would turn out to be a little bit different. So obviously, I mean, I, I think that this is clear just by looking at the pictures, but turbulence is super hard to deal with. Um, you know, like all the tools that you've learned in, you know, the six mathematics courses that we've forced you to take, unfortunately, are not really enough to be able to describe those kind of flow patterns. Um, so if you have a crazy flow pattern in a pipe, it's basically hopeless to try and describe or solve for the velocity everywhere in the flow. Um, in fact, like if you were to take a close-up look of what the velocity in the flow looks like, it's act I mean, obviously it's a function of time, right? So the velocity at any particular point in the flow is a time-varying thing that kind of looks a little bit crazy. Um, from an engineering point of view, we need to find some way to tame that because, you know, like, as an engineer, you need to be able to have some design principles that tell you like, well, how big should I make the pumps that are driving the flows in these things? Um, you know, what kind of velocities can I expect to get? And um, we don't really need all those details, right? Like we're, we, we don't really want all those details. And so um, the way that people typically deal with this, um, honestly, is just by taking a time average. So we won't even attempt to figure out what the actual exact flow pattern looks like. We'll hope, our best hope, which is actually still semi-empirical, is to try and find the average velocities at any particular point. So even though like there's a turbulent flow and at any given time the velocities are doing crazy things, um, what we'll try and do is at every point in the flow we'll try and find the time averaged velocity. And it'll turn out that after you do some time averaging there's actually like a I mean, the, the actual flow pattern is not smooth, but the time average is actually smooth. Um, and we'll try and figure out what those um, velocity profiles look like once they're sort of smoothed with a time average. Um, in general, that's actually still too hard to do entirely with, with mathematics and formulas, but what we will eventually see is that there's an interplay between people who do experiments. So we can do experiments and measure all of these things like the exact velocity patterns, um, average pattern, you know, average flow velocities and such. And so people have conducted a lot of experiments which have led to sort of engineering principles that we can use to fit to obtain formulas that an engineer can use to actually do things in practice. And over time, like a, a lot of that initial work, and, and actually most of the principles you'll use came from experiments, but over time it has become slightly more tractable to, to use computers to figure out some of these things. So um, although computers are generally not used very heavily, I would say, um, to figure out what turbulence, pa what exact turbulent pattern patterns are, they can be used in certain situations. And so computers now play a decent role in, you know, interplaying with both experiments and leading to mathematical formulas that people can use.